Lee Crutchley investigates a situation which might well develop into a choral tragedy in this country. It was in April 1968 that the choir school of All Saints Margaret Street, London, closed its doors. They shut on a tradition of church music that had inspired worship and beauty for nearly 120 years. And that its closure shocked not only those in ecclesiastical circles, but lovers of music all over the world, was an indication of the quality of its music past and present. Although the men singers were of a high standard, it was for the boys' voices for which the choir had always been famous. They carried on the great tradition of English church music, but their repertoire included all that was best of continental church music, and the boys were taught to sing in two different styles. The announcement that the school was to close was sudden and dramatic. No appeals for help went out. It was presented as a fait accompli. The cry went up that the choir must be saved, but no tangible help in the way of money was forthcoming, and so it was left to die. But perhaps from this death of a choir school there is something to be learned, and those of us who love church music will perhaps attach more value to those choirs that are left. The news that the school was to close came early in the new year. The headmaster told me the effect it had on the boys. They received the news during the Christmas holidays. So I didn't see the initial shock. But when they came back at the beginning of term, which was the 5th of January, the looks on their faces told me that this was the end of the world. The worst thing that could possibly have happened. They were very quiet, nothing much to talk about. They were really heartbroken. But through, I think, hard work on the part of the staff, we've got them places in other schools, choir schools or public schools. We've talked about the tremendous advantages of their new school compared with this one, the things they'll be able to do there that they cannot do here. And I think now they're all very enthusiastic and looking forward to their new school. These next few days are going to be very difficult because they'll have to say goodbye and it's breaking with the tradition and the life that they know. But I think on the whole now they really are looking forward to the school that they're going to. With great enthusiasm. Wasn't this really something worth saving? Yes. And I think we've done all we can in discussion and searching around to find some way of saving it. But everybody concerned has said, quite rightly, that it will only be saved if a proper standard can be maintained. A high standard of music, and a high standard of education. We've had possibilities that would enable us to do one or the other, but not both. We want nothing substandard, and we don't want church music on the cheap. It's got to be the best or nothing, and I'm afraid we could not find any alternative that would give us the best. When I met the boys, they had, of course, got over the shock. As the headmaster said, all of them had found places elsewhere. Other choir schools had been only too ready to take them in. One of the choristers told me how he was feeling at the thought of the school being disbanded. A bit sad, perhaps, because I'd have to find a new life in a different place and be so different. The music standards have been 
high and it seems an awful pity to suddenly go right down the scale to quite a low standard. I understand women are going to sing here. Yes, I don't uh, really like the idea personally. Women that aren't very nice sound to my ears. What then was the reason for the school having to close and who was responsible? The basic reason is that we feel we are unable to provide a decent standard of education for the boys. Um, the finances available are just not sufficient. We need a lot of improvements. We must expand in order to meet the um, new Department of Education and Science regulations. And to expand or to re-equip costs money. And we just haven't the money. It meant, of course, a new life for the headmaster and the organist Michael Fleming, who'd watched over the music the last ten years. What were his feelings? Immense disappointment, of course, naturally, because I realised that this would mean that the, the whole character of the choir would change. Uh, I was sure that the choir of some kind would continue. After all, the choir school was originally founded here almost 120 years ago for the purpose of providing music for this church of the highest possible standards and it was the intention of the founders of the school that this should be done in this way and they saw that the, the only way it could be done was by founding of a school. On what I wondered was the musical reputation of All Saints founded. There has been a very unique tradition of course here at All Saints of music based I would say mainly on continental church music not as a substitute for but as an alternative to English church music and so I've always tried to see that the two schools of church music both continental and English have equal place on, on the programs and particularly this applies to Viennese masses for which I think this church has been very famous for many years. That Kyrie liaison from the Mozart Mass in C was sung on Easter Sunday just before the boys left the school. When Alec Robertson, the musician, writer, 
and in his earlier days the church organist heard it, he remarked, St. Augustine said years ago, as the music entered into my ears, truth distilled in my heart. And very often people are touched to something that they hadn't experienced before. And this would all stop if these choir schools have, owing to financial difficulties, uh, to cease. And I'm afraid that choir boys are a vanishing race. You see, they, the, the telly and all these things drawing them away all the time. Women do a fine work in this, but it's no substitute in the kind of music, the best kind of music, the uh, Renaissance and, and Bach and so on, which was written for boys' voices, and which boys' voices alone can give the real spiritual feeling of the music, I think, to the utmost. So the boys' choir of All Saints has been disbanded. Other choir schools are feeling the financial pinch. St. Paul's, Westminster Abbey, and Westminster Cathedral, the three great London choirs, while in no danger of closing, need funds to maintain the standards they have set for themselves. Quality in music is expensive. So is quality in education. And in both they take pride. The headmaster of St. Paul's told me what he sets out to do for his boys. We give them a, a general education along the lines of a normal prep school, covering all the, the, the usual subjects of the curriculum. Of course, because they're musical, naturally, a considerable part, even outside choir, is spent on, on music. Because all the boys learn at least one instrument, and about half the school are learning two, which range from strings to woodwind and brass, and of course the piano. What kind of boy do you look for? A boy who is clearly musical, um, and also one who is intelligent, because generally speaking, a boy needs to be intelligent to carry in his head the repertoire and be able to read the psalms and so on in daily services. And so the more intelligent a boy is usually, uh, the more suitable he is as a chorister. The headmaster speaks of reading the psalms. The boys of all saints illustrate what he says with their controlled plain chant singing. Colin Morby, as choir master at Westminster Cathedral, knows what being a chorister does for his boys. It gives them a spiritual background. It gives them a knowledge of music. It makes them appreciate the order of music. It makes them appreciate beauty. It makes tremendous demands upon discipline. It gives the boys something which other schools don't give them, just purely because of the demands it makes upon them. It just puts a tremendous stamp upon their character. It's something which they can look back on when they leave. And of course, it teaches them how to work. It's, um, it's the sort of education which they can be very proud of. Christopher Durnley, organist of St. Paul's Cathedral, while preparing his boys to the highest musical standards, doesn't set out particularly to make them either professional singers or instrumentalists. Not at all. I think um, a number of choruses go on to um, excel in the musical profession, but I think, uh, and these make their name, but there are also a large number who have gained a basic musical skill and a, an ability to enjoy and appreciate music 
which stands them in good stead in whatever walk of life they eventually go to. And I think really um, the greatest value is in this sort of general cultural background and, and awareness of, of um, artistic spheres that a chorister gains uh, almost naturally through his training. And this, I feel, is, is as valuable, if not more so, than the um, specific professional skills which are, are useful to somebody who takes up music in a professional way. There are those today who believe that a professional choir hinders instead of helps worship, that it limits the congregation's participation in the service. Colin Morby has definite views on this. I'm not against congregational singing, but it is a very limited and restricted medium. Choirs do give something. They give discipline, they give beauty, they give colour, which a congregation can't give. And it's up to a place like Westminster Cathedral to give the lead in this and show other choirs what can be achieved. One obviously can't give a lead by destroying everything that's gone before and the idea that one can replace a tradition of a thousand years in five years is quite ridiculous. If I stopped singing all the traditional music in Westminster Cathedral tomorrow, there'd be nothing to replace it with. But having said that and, was, and maintaining this tradition, one must also keep one's eyes open and try and introduce anything new, anything worthwhile, which comes from this new liturgical reformation. Alec Robertson was even more emphatic than Colin Morby when I confronted him with the same argument. I think that is absolute nonsense. It's an opinion, I, I regret to say, which is held by many priests who are... You must remember that about 90% of priests and, and much more of bishops and things are quite unmusical. But let that pass. No, 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 no. The church went singing into the world from the beginning and has never stopped. And, moreover, I can say this, knowing it in many ways, that theology makes no appeal to people whatsoever. To take one good example, birds ave verum corpus natum, that wonderful um, motet of his, hail true body, born of the Virgin Mary, and you feel the truth of the thing as you would never feel it read on the page. The music brings it right home to you the whole time. So prayer and music are bound up together in this because the music is sung prayer.
Pio Jesu from the Requiem Mass by Gabriel Fauré. We've spoken of money, and it seems that it would have saved the choir school of all saints. It was not to be expected that the congregations could have raised it, but the choir had an international reputation. It contributed to the wider world of music. The encouragement of the arts in Britain is vested in the Arts Council. Some five million pounds a year from public funds is voted to them annually. A small part of the national budget may be, but only a very small amount of this would have been necessary to support and prop the choir of all saints. I put the case of the choristers to their music advisor, John Cruft. There have always been good individual boy singers, of course, who haven't necessarily been in choirs. Uh, one used to meet them on the variety halls. It's a great natural talent that some of them have. But we have been fortunate, we've always felt, in having our cathedral tradition. If one wanted to argue against this, one could have said that this was too narrowing a life and that we would have been far happier musically if we'd had an operatic tradition like Italy. Not a particularly sympathetic attitude. Why was it, I wondered, that the Arts Council were pulling back? Well, the Arts Council isn't pulling back. It isn't rushing forward. It hasn't been asked to do anything about this yet. But my guess is that it would say, these are not concerts. They are an embellishment of the churches where they're held, and they are not, therefore, for support by taxpayers' money in the way that the music that is done only for art's sake can be supported. I'm surprised to learn that the Arts Council will do nothing to support church choirs. They say, I'm told, that they should support themselves. And yet, we know what can be spent on pictures, or the crucifixion or something like that, and on buildings too, and yet the sounds that should come out of these buildings, which the stones in the ancient buildings are resonant with, no. They haven't understood, they simply haven't understood what this glorious music means in this rather dirty world, going up like incense in the sight of God to heaven.
Eton College Choir School, with its strong choral and orchestral tradition, has also had to close this year. The reasons are similar to those that obtained at All Saints. However, the music at Eton will continue, since now they will draw on the school's resources, and in addition will annually give music and choral scholarships on the same terms as their King's scholarships. As I've said, the three main London choirs of St Paul's, Westminster Abbey and Westminster Cathedral would like financial help. They found a friend in the Lord Mayor of London, Sir Gilbert Inglefield. An amateur musician himself and a flautist of some ability, he has given his support to the English Church Music Trust who are trying to raise money to give the choirs any extra help that they need. He told me his reasons. I think you see these three choirs uh, represent the best of church music, the best of the giving of church music, probably in England. I know by saying that every cathedral choir will be up in arms, but I still think that St Paul's and Westminster Abbey and Westminster Cathedral in their own particular line are right at the top of the class. Therefore, if they decline in any way, there's a danger the church music may go downhill, which would be a, a dreadful thing because it's a most important tradition. I think that English church music is one of the most important of all English musical traditions. He goes back to the days of Bird earlier than that. I sometimes, sometimes like to say that had there been no school of early 15th century church music in England, there might never have been a Palestrina. You say that to an Italian, it doesn't go down too well. But English church music did graduate across the continent from England through the Netherlands down to Italy. But you have to be a little careful what you say sometimes to. Italian musicians when you point that out to them. Today we are saying that no boy should be entitled to a special kind of education. I would wholly and entirely disagree with that. I think that if a boy has certain gifts then they must be brought out to the full. And if those gifts can be encouraged in any possible way they should be encouraged. Sir Gilbert felt that these three choirs as it were showed the way to others. I think they're rather like, uh, how shall I put it, three lighthouses in a rather tempestuous sea sometimes. They are the highest that we have at the moment uh, for choirs in the church music tradition. Technically they're magnificent, these three choirs. They each have their own individual characteristics and a jolly good thing too. One must have an example to follow, mustn't one? One must have some form of leadership. One must have a lighthouse. And I think these three choirs are three important lighthouses. Just as the proof of the pudding is in the eating, so the proof of a chorister's life must show through the boys themselves, not just through the music they make. I spoke to many. A typical example was a boy from St Paul's. I asked him how he enjoyed life. It's uh, great fun, especially when it's being televised or broadcasted, because after the um, service or whatever it is, hundreds of re relatives who have heard or seen you um, write letters and one normally gets about six letters after the all uh, talking about the same subject of oh i saw you on television yesterday or something like that yes you become as it were something of a special boy yes. do you feel this though really in your ordinary everyday life not at the school no at the school i'm perfectly normal it's only when I go for holidays, go back home, and when you mix with normal schoolboys and girls who you sort of knew before you went, that you feel that um, you have to be a bit more sort of well behaved and not let yourself go as much because you're expected uh, sort of to do that coming from the school. Are you glad you have come here? Yes, yes, I am very Why? glad. Why? Well, it's a very good training and also. It gives you an excellent opportunity to going on to good schools afterwards. Having such small classes, um, the average school would have 40, but we have 17 at the very most, and that's uh, the very most the school's ever known. And even as low as four in a class, we had that a few terms ago. And it's sort of, you have, um, well, the, the teachers sort of are, are much more, how can I put it? You're treated more, you might call it. What kind of music do you like best? Well, I'm, I'm one of the few people who like pop music. I like that a lot. I like 
all types of classical music. I'm very fond of 1920 show mu music, and also I like the um, Tudor periods, things like Bird and Tallis and Morley and various other composers like that. Do you find that the tremendous discipline that you must have here, the discipline that music demands, is can be annoying, can be a chore? Sometimes. Sometimes. I, I know that in work, especially, the dis discipline of, say, as we have so much music, we have to do extra work, things like prep and everything. And you may want to write a letter on Sunday, and you'll have no time right through on Thursday when you could possibly write a letter from all these routine timetables. Even when you have a, an hour free time, you may be catching up on your history so you could have it um, ready by the next lesson. So often you feel somewhat depressed when trying to find the odd moments and you often find writing uh, a letter on Tuesday and putting down the date of Tuesday and actually posting it on the Saturday. What do you think about during services? Sometimes uh, you wander during the Magnificat, you might call it. If uh, a certain subject has been brought up and you think about that subject, uh, your mind seems to wander on and on, and by the end of the Gloria, you've changed to a completely different subject, and you wonder whether you've been singing at all in that Magnificat. But I've often asked people whether I was actually singing in that thing, but you seem to do it automatically, although you don't know it. You're looking at the music and singing as if you're um, paying complete attention, but yet your mind is miles away on top of the dome.
What are you going to do when you finish schooling altogether? Well, I want to become a doctor. I, I'm not quite sure what type of a doctor I want to go to, uh, into research, but uh, I think now I've decided I'd prefer to be a GP. What about music? What part's that going to play in your life? Well, I want to do a bit of part-time opera. Also, my cello, I want to keep that up. I don't think I'm going to actually take it up as a career, though, ever. What do you think it's done for you? It's given me something uh, to be able to mix with musicians. Um, if anybody um, in the musical world could talk to me, I could quite easily talk back to them uh, with reasonable conversation. It seems uh, when you're, you are doing music to clear your mind, I know often if I'm practicing, it gives me a sort of angelic feeling, you might call it. Oh, poems sometimes. I've always wanted to write a poem on a choir boy. And I would talk about the choir boy's outward appearance of the white robe, his surplus. But then if you look closely, you see the black cassock underneath, and that's really what it is. <laughs> What's your idea of beauty? Well, I find, well, in, I, Oft, well, quite often go to places like the Royal Albert Hall and I find if at 10 o'clock at night, say, you're listening to the second half and you're um, dead to the world except to the music and you lean on the rail in front of you and you actually picture it as if it was a film and this is the music going on and it seems sort of, well, it seems to me the most beautiful thing when you actually see all the music taking place and how you try to think how the composer wanted it to be, and sort of music really is not music. It's a type of a type of painting pictures, actually, uh, without putting them on paper. Oh, Philip, one or two choir schools are having to close. All Saints is already closed, and Eton Choir. What are your feelings about this? Well, a rather distressed because I think. If any boy could be in one of these choirs, he's obviously well, very good at singing, and especially All Saints Margaret Street. I've heard them quite a few times before they actually um, closed. And oh, I think it's a great pity, and I don't see why the members of the public didn't stop it, because it seems such a shame. I know, I only hope it doesn't happen anywhere else, because my brother is at Westminster Abbey, and I think that it should, all choir schools, um, even if they're in terrible finance, should find some way of being able to carry on instead of having to close down. I think even if it means, well, asking the public, it seems such a shame of tradition. I think it's a great loss, a great loss indeed.
Death of a Choir School was compiled and introduced by Lee Crutchley. The music was sung by the choir of All Saints Margaret Street, London, and recorded during the last year of the choir school's existence. The programme was produced by Maurice Brown. <laughs>